on August 3rd, 1944, in the skies over the town of Vire in France. The law of averages caught up with fighter pilot Quentin Annenson of Luverne, Minnesota. I was flying the tail end Charlie position, which means the last one in the line of flight, which is the most vulnerable position because that's the one they'll start with first. And suddenly the uh, 88s and 20 millimeters started coming up in heavy amounts and just boom, I heard this roar through my airplane and fire came into the cockpit and just all in, in an instant. My airplane was shaking. I was, well, I'm gone. So I tried to bail out. I tried to move the canopy back and a piece of flak had come up through the glide. And so I couldn't get the, the canopy open, couldn't get it open. The fire was still coming at me. And so I put the plane in a dive because We'd always discussed that we didn't want to die by burns. And so I put the plane in a dive. I was only at 4,000 feet, so I could hit the ground fast. And that move literally saved my life because the uh, air pressure changed, and so the flames were sucked out through that opening in the canopy, and that fire died out. And I got back to the base, I would stall if my speed dropped below 160 miles an hour. So I landed at 170 miles an hour. And I didn't know that one of the 20 millimeters had come up through my left wheel well, and I had a flat tire there. So when the landing gear collapsed on one side, I was still going about 100 miles an hour. And I was spun around by the force my shoulder harness on the right broke loose. The left one held. I was spun around at the back of my head at the gun side. So I was unconscious, and a couple of enlisted men had pulled me out and pulled me away from there. After medics tended to his dislocated shoulder and the burns on his legs, a British photographer from Picture Post magazine asked Allenson to pose with his plane. Al McIntosh, Rock County Star Herald. Lieutenant John Stavanger, bomber pilot now in England, has decided it's a mighty small world after all. He hadn't hardly landed before he bumped into Lieutenant Howard James of Laverne. Then he leisurely settled back and read an English magazine. He looked at one big picture of a wrecked plane. The picture carried the caption, The Man Who Was Lost Returns to Base. The pilot in question was none other than Lieutenant Quentin Anderson of Laverne. His family knew nothing of the incident. And the picture showed the Laverne youngster walking away from his wrecked plane as blithely unconcerned as if he'd just bought a nickel's worth of candy. A week after his close call, Anderson was back in the air providing ground cover for the Americans advancing toward Germany. Everybody had a radio during the war, no TVs. And three times a day, you got the national news. And three times a day, you did not be far from that radio. And of course, my mother had about a four by four map. I really don't know where she got it. It was a map of all of Europe. And she had a big long rule stick, and that map hung right there, and it covered that little wall where the um, buffet is. And when news time came, she followed all the battles with the rule stick on the map. She would have been a great historian. She would have been.
Before the Japanese attacked on December 7, 1941, most Americans could not have found Pearl Harbor on a map. In the two and a half years that followed, they had had to learn a host of new names of the places their sons were fighting. Kasserine Pass and Monte Cassino and Anzio, Utah Beach and Omaha Beach, San Mary Glees and San Lo and the Falaise Gap. And on the other side of the world, Guam and Bataan and Guadalcanal, Midway and Saipan and the Philippine Sea. Before the war could end, the citizens of Mobile, Alabama and Sacramento, California, Luverne, Minnesota and Waterbury, Connecticut and every other town in America would be forced to learn still more names. Arnhem and Aachen and the Hurtgen Forest, the Vosges Mountains and the Ardennes and Remagen, Peleliu and Luzon and Iwo Jima and more. And young men from those towns would learn lessons as old as war itself. That generals make plans, plans go wrong, and soldiers die. For Tom Galloway, a college student from Mobile, a strategic mistake would put him in an unwinnable battle where the only victory to be had was survival. Robert Kachawagi of Sacramento who had had everything taken from him by his country, would be asked to give even more. And Quentin Amundsen of Laverne, who had lost so many friends and seen so much death, would endure still more horror and nearly lose all hope. To the non-combatants and those on the periphery of action, the war meant only boredom or occasional excitement but to those who entered the meat grinder itself, the war was a netherworld of horror from which escape seemed less and less likely as casualties mounted and the fighting dragged on and on. Time had no meaning. Life had no meaning. The fierce struggle eroded the veneer of civilization and made savages of us all. Eugene Sledge. The men coined names for the chaos in which they often found themselves and the ineptitude of some of the officers who sent them there, employing language they would never have used in front of their mothers or their wives back home. Snafu, situation normal, all up, and foobar, up beyond all recognition. General Patton is a very wise person despite his personal eccentricities. He said a number of memorable things about war that only real soldiers know. He says that all plans last only to the time of the first shot and they're set aside. Then you just have to go on sheer invention and guts and, uh, and not running away and various other things that are never, never mentioned. By September of 1944, the Allies seemed to be moving steadily toward victory in Europe. On the Eastern Front, the Russians had taken parts of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and inflicted 700,000 more casualties on the retreating Germans. And in the 11 weeks since D-Day, American, British, and Canadian forces had freed most of France and Belgium and parts of Holland and were arrayed along the 350-mile belt of concrete fortifications the Germans called the West Wall. Beyond it lay the heart of Germany itself. 
Allied planners had not expected their forces to get that far for another eight months. George Patton's third army had set the pace, covering 400 miles in less than 30 days. Though he had outrun his supplies and was desperately short of fuel. His armored columns alone required some 600,000 gallons of gasoline every 50 miles. On September 11th, an armored unit of the U.S. First Army crossed the German frontier near Stolzenberg. Militarily, General Dwight Eisenhower's chief of staff told the press, this war is over. Post exchanges were ordered to halt all holiday packages for the men on the European front. Nearly everyone was certain the war would be over by Christmas. There was no room in the supply trucks for winter clothing either. Besides, the men wouldn't need it. Meanwhile, the British had taken the important Belgian port of Antwerp. But no fuel or supplies could be landed there because the Germans still held the estuary that lay between the city and the North Sea. Eisenhower ordered British General Bernard Montgomery to clear them out. That would have taken weeks, and Montgomery proposed a daring alternative designed to speed the Allied advance into Germany. Operation Market Garden. First, American and British airborne troops would be dropped behind German lines to seize bridges along a 65-mile highway from Belgium through Holland to Arnhem. Then the British Second Army would race along that highway, cross the Rhine at Arnhem, go around the northern end of the West Wall, and drive into the Ruhr Valley, the center of German industrial might. For the risky plan to succeed, everything had to go perfectly and quickly. Eisenhower thought the gamble was worth it. If it did succeed, the war could end in weeks. I not only approved of Market Garden, he said later, I insisted on it. 